Welcome to the GSMC Pets Podcast, the show that caters to pet lovers of all kinds. We'll talk about pets on social media, pets doing amazing things, and how to take care of the pets in your life. Whether your pet is a dog, a cat, a llama, hamster, reptile, or something more exotic, you'll find educational and entertaining information on the GSMC Pets Podcast. Howdy, howdy. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Pets Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sam, and my little co-host, Eisen, is at my feet taking a good nap on his favorite blanket. It's not the yellow one. It's the uh, a red one. He always likes to color red for some reason. But hey, as long as he's happy. Now, today, well, first of all, I have to say this. Today is my first official day of summer break so I'm gonna have a few weeks of not going into the office and you know doing any lesson plans all that kind of stuff I am free which means I need books to read and I figured that why not choose some books or share some books that I found online that sound pretty interesting and maybe you guys would want to read it too but I will say that most of these are uh, for adults, more of like uh, higher reading levels. And hey, maybe you have a child that is a great reader, and this might be a good start for them to just kind of delve into uh, stories about pets and, you know, animals in general, uh, just being animals. <laughs> so I will say that the last segment will be kind of special to me because it's a book that really sticks with me. I don't know. When did I read it? I was in elementary school when I first read this. And, well, I'm not really a fan of horses, but this book really inspired and made kids really love the idea of having a horse. So you know those kids with horse obsessions and stuff. So that's just a sneak peek for the last segment. But for the beginning of this show, I'm going to talk to you about, let's see, five different books that you can read that involve animals and pets. So let's get started. Now the first story that I really wanted to talk about was this um, 2010 science fiction novel by a South African author named uh, Lauren Bukes, B-E-U-K-E-S. And the really cool thing about it is that this book that she wrote, Zoo City, uh, actually won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and for those of you who are, you know, not really into the science fiction award thing, Arthur C. C. Clarke was actually um, a very accomplished uh, science fiction writer. And, hey, if you want to check out those books, go right ahead. They're probably going to be all over in the library, to be honest. Now, let's see. For the most part... Whenever I look at this, I mean, the cover is very interesting. It looks like there are all kinds of animals in this, in this cover, which is interesting. But this book was published June 1st, 2010 in South Africa, and then it came to the U.S. and Canada on the 28th of December of the same year. Now, what exactly is Zoo City? Because it seems like a very kind of strange idea, but it leads to a lot of questions. Like, what does it exactly mean, Zoo City? Are there a ton of animals just kind of hanging out in, you know, in a suburb or something? Well, <laughs> it's actually a bit more complicated than that. So, uh, Zoo City is basically another version of the South African city of Johannesburg. And basically, People who have committed like some sort of crime are actually magically attached to an animal familiar. 
and that's basically a pun- you know their punishment and it's kind of like well they have the, their punishment and they're officially called or referred to as animaled so already you're kind of getting like this weird like why what is it what exactly is the problem with this but it's basically like kind of a form of shaming so think like the scarlet letter um where uh hester prine wears like the a on her um on her clothes that says adulterer well that stands for adulterer um but let's see the protagonist is a woman called zinzi december very interesting i didn't realize her last name was december but she was once a journalist and she is currently a recovering drug addict who was animaled with a sloth and you know you kind of wonder why does she get a sloth and i kind of want to know that definitely want to know that and she is animaled like after her after she somehow gets her brother killed so she's listening she's living in the johannesburg suburb of hillbro oh which is nicknamed Sioux City. So I'm, I was kind of on point there. <laughs> so there are a lot of people that have been animaled and there are refugees and also the dispossessed. And she's trying, Zinzi is trying to like pay back some financial debt that she owes her drug dealer. Um, and she, and this is what she mostly does. She has the ability, well, Basically, when you get animaled in the story, you have your animal that is, you know, stuck with you, but also you get some sort of psychic power. And it seems to me that Zinzi has this ability to find lost objects because of this, because of this animal. That's what I'm assuming here. So she also is, well, a, a writer because, well, she was a former journalist, and she, you know, during the story, actually drafts, like, fraud emails, and, let's see, 419, so, or 419, I'm not sure there, um, but it focuses on her attempts to find this missing female member of a brother and sister pop duo, uh, for a music p- producer, and then, well, when she finishes that, she will hopefully have enough money to pay back her drug dealer. Now, when it gets into the animaling, animaling thing, that's a very <laughs> difficult thing to say for me for some reason. But it's not just in South Africa. It's actually all around the world. And it's basically uh, bearing, it's putting on like this significant amount of guilt, like, for the individual that is animaled. And it's not really clear about like moral and legal culpability, but I mean, it, it does kind of have different triggers and it's kind of hard to really choose between that, but most definitely getting someone killed because of you, you're definitely going to be animaled. <laughs> so as I said, the animals, um, give their, their human counterparts, like special abilities, more of like a psychic power. And the, that's the good part of it. But there's a, you know, there's a, a problem that they have to face and they have to be close. They have to remain close to their familiars. Um, the humans have to stay close to the animal familiars. And well, essentially if they stray too far, the the individual would be like subject to like uh panic attacks that you know leave them incapacitated uh let's see nausea and other withdrawal symptoms so it's kind of like maybe i think in the case of zinzi it might be uh kind of demonstrating the difficulty of uh recovering from addiction so i think that's actually quite interesting and, well, let's see. The animals are not limited uh, by the normal lifespans of the species. And, well, they can die by violence, but 
Should that animal die, the owner will be torn to shreds by a mysterious dark cloud called the undertow within minutes. Oh my gosh, that's kind of <laughs> amazing. But I just kind of think it would be, you know, an interesting book to read. Just kind of getting a perspective of drug addiction and then also the amount of guilt that somebody has that kind of manifests into something that they're kind of burdened with, but also get extra insight with this, with the psychic powers that they have. And that's pretty, I think that's pretty cool. Now, there was a planned film adaptation, but I haven't seen any like additional, additional kind of, uh, information about it. But I would have to say that this series, well, not series, this book is going to be like a very interesting thing where, hey, you get insight into um, these kind of like taboo subjects that we have today. And, well, you throw animals in it and it would be very interesting why certain people get certain animals in this story. And I mean, gosh, I just can't... I kind of want to see if this book is in the library now because, well, I mean, <laughs> it's a very interesting idea and I'm all about sci-fi. So <laughs> I would really like to get my hands on this book and hopefully I would be able to talk to you guys about it, you know, later on, kind of give my a review of it, I guess. But that might just be something, you know, that you won't, that you'll have to wait for for a while. <laughs> Because I have a huge reading list already. And of course, I want to add more to it by doing this podcast episode. <laughs> but yeah, I would really think that overall it's been very well received. I mean, again, it was awarded the Arthur C. Clarke Award. And let's see, she also got a 2010 Kitschie's Red Tentacle for our best novel. I have no idea what that is, but hey, I mean, an award is an award, though I guess, you know, World's Worst Book is also an award too. But again, seems very well received, is um, a very interesting concept, and I mean, gosh, there's there's so much more that I have questions about for this story, and I wish that I had them. But, unfortunately, I need to make a trip to the library, which I can do this Monday, which is awesome. <laughs> anyway, we are going to take a brief break, and let's see, what are we going to talk about today? I'm so excited, and it is the, huh, the guest cat, and that is um, written by Takahashi Hirade. Karate Day? Yeah, I think that's about it. But again, we'll take a brief break and we'll get to talk about that one. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The DSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back. We were just talking about Zoo City and how it it sounds like a very interesting concept for a sci-fi novel. And I have to assume that, you know, it must be good because of the awards that it's gotten and also its nominations too. So that is definitely a book that I'm considering, you know, 
getting and then pushing the rest of my reading list to the side. Because, <laughs> well, it sounds that interesting to me. But let's get to talking about this next book. And it's called The Guest Cat. And basically, it's <laughs> it was a, kind of like a surprise best-selling novel like in December of, I think, 2013 or something like that. The author, Takashi Hiraide, uh, is kind of like a, a poet, some kind, you know, kind of like an artist. And you can really see it through his writing here. And basically, the story of the guest cat is, well, <laughs> it's more of a story of this couple that kind of really starts to change the way that they're living their life because they are so charmed by this cat. And it also is actually translated um, from Japanese to English. And it's translated by um, Eric Selland. And basically this story is about two very emotionally distant people, uh, a husband and a wife. And it's basically about how their lives change because of this guest that they have. And, well, I mean, they're living on a property um, owned by uh, this older couple, and this cat, they assume, belongs to one of their neighbors. So it's a very beautiful bit of property. And, well, the couple, like, they're so devoted to their work that they can't really even enjoy that because, well, they have work to do, and they really are focused on that. And I, they kind of say, um, like some of the reviews that I've seen is, well, it's kind of like to a fault that they are, uh, that devoted to their work. And they had actually, I had seen some that were talking about how the couple had a miscarriage and that just kind of added to this distance between them. So that's, that's something I could actually appreciate. If it's a part of the book, I would definitely appreciate that because, well, you don't see many, well, I have not seen many stories that uh, really talk about miscarriage and what it does to, like, a couple. I think there was one by Jhumpa Lahiri on uh, one of her short stories that um, really kind of demonstrates the issue there. But I think that this book, The Guest Cat, you know, it goes deeper into it. So, I mean, I'm all for it. Now, let's see. It says over here that these this couple, they barely speak, and they don't leave their desks. Like, they seldom do. And, well, they don't... They're not able to appreciate what's really around them. So, it's very... It's a boring... Yeah, a very boring life for them. So, they're not really fans of cats. Like, they, they don't have any pets. And I imagine that, well... They were shocked at first to see this cat. Um, the cat's name is Chibi. Uh, and, well, they're basically charmed by its personality and energy and it's just athletic skills that this cat becomes, like, so interesting and they invest so much emotion into it. And, like, eventually they... You know, once they become really attached, they are willing to break away from work because they want to, you know, they want to spend time with the cat, which is great. And I mean, it starts increasing the joy that the couple is feeling and there's just kind of like a release of tension that's going on. And well, even, even more so like the, the the couple, and they're unnamed at this point in the story, like, we don't know their names, but basically, like, the woman, the wife, starts to kind of, like, feel, um, like, this innate desire to be, to be a mother, to mother something, and, like, this was kind of, like, suppressed because of all of the, because of the, the issues that they had, you know, that's, you know, exposition for the story. Now, I will say that it's fantastic to see, like, just seeing, like, a couple grow. And we don't, I would say that 
for the most part, you don't really see, uh, at least in my perspective, many stories that kind of show this kind of growth. It's, it seems like a very special kind of growth. And I would definitely want to see this, but yeah, just, <laughs> they fall in love with this cat and just, they have like a great change in how their lives are lived. And I just am kind of amazed by it. So it really just plunges you into like a world of art, philosophy, and like just the mysterious nature of our ties to other living things. So it's, it's kind of like a story about, you know, loving, then also losing. And I wouldn't, I'm, I haven't spoiled anything for myself. So, I mean, it could either be like the loss, the miscarriage being the loss, or maybe Chibi, uh, no longer coming to them and them feeling that loss. But again, I'm not really sure because I, I refuse to spoil this for myself. It does look really interesting. Uh, the, the writer of this review that I'm looking at right now, um, well, they say that even dog lovers will relate to the story. And I have to say that, you know, I think I might be able to relate to the story just because, um, it's, it's kind of like how our dog Rody passed away. And then I, it was very sad for, you know, a good few weeks. And then we have Regina coming into our household and her becoming, you know, us falling in love with her and wanting to take care of her. She is, we joke a lot that she is our baby girl. So, and of course, Cookie is the grandma of the family. But I mean, I, I would have to say that this is a very interesting story to pick up. It's only 144 pages. Um, so I think that it's a very fast read pretty much. So I would say, take your time, pick up this book, see what happens. I mean, the author of this book, like, he has so much background in writing. He's a poet and novelist, and he just kind of infuses that into the, into this narrative that's going on. And I mean, I kind of wonder what else is going on because just... I remember seeing something about like the, uh, like a discussion of like renting guest houses and all that kind of stuff. But hey, I, that'll be something for me to figure out when I actually pick up this book. Probably from the library. Hopefully from the library. Um, gosh, I'm so excited the library is going to be opening up soon. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, this is a very, well, it's called like a very profound story and it, you know, has a lot of complexities of fate and he really just kind of infuses, as I said, infuses his poetry, his poetry background into this big story or, you know, small story because it's only 144 pages. But I mean, if I had to choose between Zoo City or the guest cat, hmm. I think maybe the guest cat because it's, because it's a shorter read and uh, I don't know, this seems to kind of touch at my heart a little bit just because of the, you know, the emotions and thoughts that kind of like came back to me, like the memories too. And I just kind of want to see where it goes, to be honest. Now, let's see, what are we going to be talking about next? Because, well, I mean, the guest cat sounds fun. The zoo city sounds fun, but where does that go? Like, let's see, what is going to be the next one that I chose? Aha! A Dog's Life, The Autobiography of a Stray by Anne Martin. So, we are going to be taking a very short break, and once we're back, we'll talk about that. And, well, enjoy the commercial. <laughs> Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
out. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. We were just talking about the guest cat and, well, also uh, Zoo City. So those two stories are very interesting, very different as well. And I think that this next one, which is actually um, for children, so this might be something to, you know, let your kids read, is... What is it called again? It, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's see. It is the... Story, A Dog's Life, The Autobiography of a Stray. So, honestly, there's not really much on this story, but I will go ahead and say that the author, Anne Martin, is known for her other books, like uh, like the Babysitter's Club si- series, the California Diaries series. Um, she, she really does... I, I should have known, shouldn't I? Well, the thing is, I never read Babysitter Slip, so I can't really say anything against it. But, you know, reception-wise, the story was called Heart-Wrenching as well as Heartwarming. So you you and your kids would probably have, like, a little bit of, of a roller coaster ride. Because the plot of the story kind of, like, not in a bad way, it goes kind of everywhere. Like, and again, it's not a bad, you know, in the bad way. Um... But overall, like, there are, you know, some consistency issues when it comes to what the main dog of the story is. And, well, it's mostly overshadowed by, like, just the raw emotion and the dramatic moments that, you know, occasionally happen in the story. So this book did win the Young Reader's Choice Award in 2008. So that's pretty cool. Now, overall, it has a lot of, you know, interesting characters, but I wanted to really focus on what exactly the plot is without giving you too much of a, of a spoiler, you know? So there is this dog named Squirrel. She is a mixed breed dog and she lives in a shed behind like the summer home of a, of a wealthy family. So she, her mother and her brother, you know, live there and well, they're the bone and squirrel are the only two of five in a litter that survived. So it's already kind of like a close knit kind of family just because of the loss there. But the mom, her name is Stream, or she calls herself Stream. Well, she is teaching both squirrel and her brother how to how to take care of themselves, to be aware of humans because she doesn't trust them. And then suddenly, just one day, their mom's dream left the shed, but she never came back. And you don't know what happens to her. Either maybe the wealthy family uh, who are the Marians, maybe they actually uh, maybe took her to the pound. Maybe she got into an accident. We don't know. And you know, that kind of goes into the tragedy of what goes around with, um, stray animals. So, you know, actually it's really funny to, that you think about it now, but we have two original stray animals and that's Reggie and, and Aizen. So, I mean, I can't help but wonder about, 
uh, the, like, the, the family that they came from. And when I say that a family, I'm not really talking about, like, a normal human family, just kind of like, you know, a cat family or a dog family. Anyway, in the second part of this book, well, Squirrel meets this dog that goes by Moon, and, you know, basically they become best friends, and then in part three, Moon dies. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I think that's like a spoiler there. But, like, they are, you know, they are taken care of, um, Squirrel's leg is broken, and she is once again by herself. So she then lives in a garage and for a time she is, you know, kind of happy, but the family leaves this, this summer home that she's staying at, you know, for the garage and they leave and well, to her, she really never, <laughs> she never really had them again, I guess. Um, but they had actually called her because they were kind of like adopting her during this time period. And she was going by Daisy, but yeah, she was abandoned once again, alone and this time for years. And it's, you know, it's just kind of back to, um, back to the, the silence, the lonely life of a stray. And I actually forgot to mention that she is also without her brother, Bone. So I'm not going to tell you what happens there. But yeah, by part four, well, Squirrel is an old dog. And like, you can imagine old dogs on the side of the road. You feel for them. And there are people that will stop for them. But other people will just kind of drive past because, well it's not really their problem <laughs> it seems like but she does like take cover during a rainstorm in a shed and then like an old woman that lives you know lives in this uh this property like comes out she sees her and she tries to gain um squirrel's trust and squirrel tries to gain her trust so basically the story ends with happily ever after and you get so, you get this very good feeling towards the end. So, you know, it's, it's a typical kind of, um, a children's story where for the most part, there things turn out okay for the most part. But yeah, for me, I might, I might suggest this to some of my students for reading because it sounds, you know, sounds interesting and engaging. Um, and you know, uh, people can enjoy stories about dogs and you know cats and just I don't know just kind of this story of you know I don't know what to say just kind of a story of survival I suppose and with my particular student population like this is definitely a story that they would really look at and hopefully enjoy because they also come from a background where they are you know basically working for survival going day by day, losing people to, that they love, and then having to move on, get stronger, or at least put the walls up. And, I mean, I might need to get a copy of this book for uh, for my classroom. I really think that would be good for them. Now, there's a lot of characters in this in the story, and, I mean, some... I think it might be a lot of characters, to be honest. But, yeah, I... Let's see. They have like a section over here that says the stray dogs. And I guess, well, okay. Why not? Man, there are a lot of, there are a lot of characters here. Not saying that's bad per se, but let's see. This, how long is this book? 192 pages. Hmm. I imagine that the, the amount of characters is more reflective of, well, uh, squirrels transient life at this, you know, throughout this story. So, I mean, I guess it makes sense. But, yeah, just, to be honest, this has a target audience of grades 4 through 7. But I think that, you know, it's a good story to just kind of flip through and just 
Let me sit back and relax. Uh, it's like a lot of Anne Martin's books are like based on personal experiences and also contemporary problems or events. So in this case, she's really focusing on the life of a stray and the struggles that it could possibly go through. So, I mean, okay, I can feel it. But yeah, it's very different from the other stories, not because it's because of the reading level, but because, well, it's strictly the, um, the dog's perspective, it seems like. Let's see. Yeah, pretty much. This is the first sto story that we're looking at, that it is from strictly the dog's per um, point of view. So, I mean, that's, that is kind of a change of pace for a lot of people. And I kind of wonder how the voice of, of a squirrel is, honestly. But we are now going to take another break. And I mean, thank you so much for taking some time to really, you know, look at, well, listen to different possible books that you can be reading over the summertime, especially if we might be, you know, back in our houses again. So I guess... <laughs> I guess that's great. And well, we'll now be looking at a, at a, well, oh, that's a movie. Oh, uh, a comic, a graphic novel, and it's called The Rabbi's Cat. And well, we will start talking about that after the commercial break. Is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then, the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And, well, we were just talking about, let's see, this sad story of a stray, a dog's life. Um, we were talking about Zoo City and then also the, the guest cat. So now we're going to continue on this. And just like this last story that we talked about, we are now going to have uh, the rabbi's cat, which is also told in the perspective of the cat. Now, the really interesting thing about this is that the cat in the story um, ends up eating the family's parrot, and somehow he gets this ability to talk, like actually talk. So that is kind of like the really interesting thing that kind of uh, starts off the story, it feels like. Now, again, there are, you know, different, um, there are different well, separate kind of sections for this. So again, you might have to go and find like the individual volumes or, uh, or maybe see if there's a, an actually one big volume that has everything in it. But let's see, the story is written by Joanne Svar and it's labeled as a series of comic fantasy comic books. So, um, it was originally published in France, and then when it started getting English translations, well, it started, you know, it was actually released by Pantheon Books. So all of that is something that, you know, that's kind of like the bit of information that I could really find, because there's really limited stuff on this particular uh, series. But uh, publication date was like from 2002 to 2017 had different artists uh for the for the series but i mean overall it was very well received it seems like cuz there was a uh, an animated film made for it and when i was briefly going through google i saw like on rotten tomatoes that it did pretty well which i mean good for it i i don't really know Everyone kind of goes to Rotten Tomatoes, so I guess there is some, 
there's at least a standard there because you get a mixture of different reviews. But overall, like the story is like basically uh, about a rabbi, his daughter, and their talking cats. And apparently, this cat is like a philosopher with like scathing humor and like a surprising amount of tenderness. So you know, like a kind of like a cat. So it takes place in Algeria in 1930s. And, well, as I said, he eats the family parrot and starts talking. And the rabbi is very concerned because, like, the first thing he starts doing is telling lies. <laughs> so, I mean, he vows to, like, educate this cat in the ways of the Torah. <laughs> and the cat, like, insists on studying for the Kabbalah and having his own bar mitzvah. So they talk to the rabbi's rabbi, and the that guy is like, no, a cat cannot be Jewish. But, of course, the cat still wants it anyway. But in addition to this rabbi, the he has a beautiful daughter, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but her name is Slavia? That sounds about right. But she actually falls in love with this younger rabbi from Harris, and, well, they have to kind of, like, the rabbi and the cats have to really overcome some, you know, some very intense feelings of, well, <laughs> shared self-pity and, and jealousy. And they, you know, the daughter gets married and they all go to France to meet uh, the in-laws. So... There's a lot of interesting drama going on over there. And, like, the really <laughs> sad thing is, like, in the middle of the story, the cat loses his ability to speak. So that kind of, like, adds to, you know, a very interesting dynamic. Because, I mean, he probably has a lot to say, especially since he was having a lot of mixed feelings about this entire thing. But I think the thing that I find most interesting is like this combination of Judaism, of um, Arab culture, and then also like French culture too, because as I said, the daughter marries uh, a rabbi from France, and apparently his family, is, his in-laws at least, well, his family, is actually... Um, not observant of Judaism. So, kind of just adds more to this huge dynamic, especially for a rabbi that is, the, the daughter's rabbi that is just very, he seems very staunch and pious. So, just kind of imagining the, the difficulty of like overcoming this hump where, well, now, I don't know if my daughter's going to be a religious anymore. And, you know, that I think that would be a very valid concern for him because, well, that's what, that's what they know. And then it's just kind of a, a whirl of anxiety that the man has had. And I really want to see, um, the actual art for it. I'm looking at a, the cover of it and it's, <laughs> I'll say that. It's very, well, they say it's like a mangy kind of, uh, feeling that they get from the, from the art itself. And I, I guess I could agree with that. Like, the cat looks really, really weird. But, hey, I, I just don't know. It's very, it's, it's very interesting, I have to say. But, yeah, I guess, you know, this entire, book is really just kind of is really considering faith and human culture from you know an outsider's point of view which i mean you can definitely say that there are some stories that do do that uh especially recently but then it's just kind of like well do we do it well and i'm curious to see what this looks like on paper so Again, it's going to be like a <laughs> another buy for me. No, no, no. It's going to be library. And if I can't find it in the library, then I'll have to figure something out. Because, well, the library is a very beautiful thing. Please go to the library. Support 
support that, please. But anyway, um, I have to say that this, I'm trying to think of the, of just kind of maybe the climax of the story and this, just kind of thinking more and more of the rising action. I would say that the rising action would really focus on the acceptance that the rabbi and the cat have to really take in. And for the daughter, I imagine that she would have to find, uh, her conflict would go into like, maybe, well, I love this man, but he's also, my, my father isn't really a fan of it. And you know, there's, I imagine that a lot of people can, uh, relate to this where, they love someone and then, you know, a family, the mother or father don't approve, uh, because of like a very fundamental part of like the family dynamics. So I would love to read this. And I mean, oh, let me have this, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I would have to say that a lot of what this story seems like is just a really good amount of reflection on how you get into um, accepting something that you're very at first not wanting and then suddenly not being able to voice what you want to say, you know, because the cat loses his voice toward, you know, in the middle of the story. So you can imagine he has a lot of thoughts, but there's no way of expressing that. So I imagine that that kind of, you know, adds more intensity in the story, to be honest. But, you know, you can always hopefully go to the library, but I found this on the Jewish Book Council website. So I would say give it a try and then... I guess, let us know what you think of it. And I mean, summertime, I, at least for the kids, they'll be able to, you know, have some reading time unless they're going to like camps and stuff. But hey, I'm not a parent. <laughs> but anyway, we are going to have another one of our breaks. And this next story, I'm going to go ahead and say it's kind of weird, <laughs> but very interesting. It's called Morte by Robert Rapino. And I will stop over there because I don't want to give it, you know, give too much right now. So we'll be back after this break. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back. And, well, what were we just talking about? We were talking about the rabbi's cat and how interesting this entire ability to talk and then losing the ability to talk would really impact uh, acceptance of something that you're not particularly fond of. But we are going to move on to this next story, which, Wow, is all I have to say. It seems like a real roller coaster ride, but not in the way that um the let's see which one was it? The the autobiography of a stray dog. So, let's just say and I'm going to quote this. It is a strange and moving sci-fi epic that channels both homeward bound and a canticle uh for Levowitz. So, 
there's that. So this story is called Morte, and it is written by um, Robert Rapino. So it has like a 4.5 out of 5 stars on Barnes & Noble. So, you know, does pretty well. There are only 6 reviews, though, so I'm not really sure. But let's see. It's basically like first a war story and then it kind of like bleeds into a detective story and if you'll you'll see what i mean now the war that is going on is essentially the war with no name and it's with <laughs> its major goal is human extinction <laughs> so his um his story really just starts off on the weirdest note anyway but yeah the main character the cat is morte is a cat assassin and basically in this story he is searching for his lost love and essentially it's a very again i'm gonna say it's pretty strange <laughs> but yeah there is like a colony, a race of intelligent ants who like have been silently building an army that would forever like destroy, uh, basically humans. Like, and they're describing it as like destructive and oppressive that these humans are. And I find that quite interesting. And honestly, they're not wrong. They're definitely not wrong. <laughs> but these, um, the colony is actually really trying to create this utopia where they are free of like humans and they're they're leaning towards like violence and exploitation and r religious superstition and then like the final step of this war effort is basically this colony using some technology and again it says over here that it's strange so a lot of emphasis on strange guys <laughs> But this technology is used to transform all of the surface animals on the planet, and they are changed into a high-functioning two-legged being so that they can rise up and kill their masters. So basically, you know, animals walking on their back legs and, you know, taking up some ways to just destroy the human race <laughs> but the story is mostly about morte and he is like a former house cat who became a war hero and he is known for like going on dangerous missions and you know fighting this human bioweapon and it's called emsa so e-m-s-a-h i don't know what the um acronym stands for so I'm probably going to find that out when I read it. <laughs> so the true motivation behind his like recklessness is his ongoing search for his pre-transformation friend, a dog named Shiva. Um, he receives a, you know, a message about, um, from like a dwindling human resistance claiming that Shiva is alive. And that's when he goes on this journey to find, to find her. So it's very, you know, very straightforward kind of, I don't, I can't even say it's a straightforward kind of story, but, um, it's strange. It's absolutely for sure. But it's also like in the story, Morte, uh, begins his journey and he's basically taken to like different remaining human strongholds. <laughs> And then over to the heart of the colony where he discovers the source of Emsa and the ultimate feat of all of Earth's creatures. So, kind of gets suspicious about what this colony is doing. And maybe they're just taking out, taking out everyone in the surface world and, you know, just living their wonderful lives without everyone. Because, <laughs> well, you kind of step on the little guys and then of course they're going to get upset. <laughs> But, yeah, I, I mean, the very interesting thing is that uh, it is, like, a search for his lost love. And I find that kind of interesting, where you're, you know, looking at a cat versus a dog. 
you know, humanoid cat and dog. Um, and that kind of, I want to say, romance that is potentially there. But again, in the description, it says, well, his friend. So I'm not really sure, you know, what exactly is this relationship that we're looking at. Because I'll go ahead and say that the description on Barnes & Noble is quite inconsistent. But, I mean, that could definitely be some allegory on uh, mixed race uh, couples and... Uh, and especially during, like, a time of war, too. I mean, that's, that is kind of, like, a huge mess, <laughs> to be honest. And also, you know, cats and dogs, fighting like cats and dogs. That just kind of comes into the natural state of mind here. And I'm just, man, I, I really want to know more about Morte. I think that he will be a very interesting character because... Well, first of all, he has shown competence on, you know, in battle and in his missions. And there's also this other side of him that, you know, is kind of like a detective. And, you know, he follows his leads and he, uh, you know, starts really delving into, like, what exactly is happening in this war. Because, well... Of course, there are always going to be underlying issues when it comes to war that not everyone knows and it's not really broadcasted. So I want to say that it's straightforward, but on the other hand, it's not really straightforward because there it feels like there are other layers going on here. And again, it sounds really strange. <laughs> it really does. But it looks like Rapino has like a history of doing like some very interesting and strange kind of stories of his own. So, I mean, I guess, I guess I definitely want to read it too. So basically all of these books that I've been talking about right now, I'm probably going to read. And I hope that I have access to these soon through the library. Again, I'm always going to talk about the library because the library is awesome. I do have to say, though, that I did find a review of the story that really kind of delves into the plot and really talks about the plot, so I can't really tell you guys everything on it. But here's what is kind of suggesting with um, with Morte and Sheba. Like, they become, like, fast friends and just they have a platonic romance. So it's, you know, it, like very close friends, pretty much. And I guess, you know, that still works out. Because honestly, you see a lot of that where dogs and cats, like somehow they be, just become very close. And it's a wonderful little relationship to watch. And I would really like to see how, uh, how this kind of looks like in the book. Like what exactly, how is the like, present it to us as readers. Because, well, I mean, platonic romance is, I mean, that could be really hard to write, especially for dogs and cats, unless, well, they're flat out very sim similar to human beings, I guess. But that opens up, like, a complete can of worms. Like, I need to know more <laughs> about this. Like, what exactly is this... Um, this colony, what are their, what do they want to do? And also, what is it, how has life really changed for these animals, like even prior to the, their transformation? But yeah, we are going to go on our final break. And well, just going to say that I'm going to withhold the name of the, <laughs> of this story up until this next, um, up until the segment that comes up. So anyway, enjoy the break, and we'll be right back.
Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. just talking about let's see morte the this weird i guess sci-fi story where you have a cat and he basically becomes a detective after being a war hero again very strange kind of looking forward to finding this book so i can read it now we are going to talk about a you know very a a very well-known story um and i can bet that every single individual that loves horses has probably read this book and also seen the movie, the movie adaptation. And this story is Black Beauty and, well, we all know it as Black Beauty, but it actually has a much longer title and it's Black Beauty, His Grooms and Companions, The Autobiography of a Horse. Yeah, (laughs) that is, that is the actual title of this book. It was written in 1877, and the author, the English author, was Anna Sewell, and she uh, died shortly after the publication of this book. So, I mean, she was never really able to see its success, but yeah, it was an immediate bestseller, and just, I mean... It still is a very widely read book today. And let's see, how many copies have sold? 50 million copies. So it's like one of the best-selling books of all time. And for a very, very good reason. Um, so it's it's really, you know, at, at the very beginning, it is focused on animal welfare. And it focuses on how to treat people, well, how to get people to treat animals with kindness, sympathy, and respect. Because for a good amount of time, like, you have probably seen a lot of things that people would do to, to animals because, well, they're animals. They can do this. They don't, they don't feel, you know, not they don't feel pain, but they feel, um, worn pretty much. But they do definitely feel pain. But yeah, all of this just kind of goes into, well, what about Black Beauty? What is so amazing about this story? And well, it, it goes down as um, children's literature. But I think I remember seeing that it was, it actually wasn't originally for children. But I just remember this story as like a very overwhelming, very emotional. Like you really got into the into the narrator who is Black Beauty. And I just, it's just something that has stuck with me. Again, I'm not really a horse person, but I, because of the story, I can at least appreciate them. And also like what I was, um, mentioning before, like there are different things that have motivated me to become a, you know, a better owner, a better pet parent, uh, to my animals. So in the story, Beauty has like, all kinds of owners. Like he starts off with this very, uh, well, when he's born, his, um, the farm that he's on, it's, you know, he has nice owners and he he has this mother and also uh, his half brother. And he is just very happy and at peace in his first home. However, he has 
like this entire chain of other owners that just get increasingly crueler throughout the story. And you, you know, wonder, it's like, why? Why does this happen? Especially when you're getting into the perspective of beauty in this. And, like, something that um, a lot of creative writing teachers say is if you want to um, really have an emotional connection to your readers, you write it in the first person. You write it in, like, a narrator that is sympathetic and just is a real it feels real like not as in like a real person but like you know they have real problems and they're being authentic so the authentic struggles that beauty has is very 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 clear and again it's reflected through all of these bad uh or cruel owners that he's had and like he's known multiple um, horses during this time period. And he also sees how they're treated and just, he kind of mourns how his life and how other horses life, uh, lives kind of just fall apart under the yoke of bad owners, pretty much. Now for this actual story, like it's, as I said, increasing problems with owners like he after his um after he leaves the english farm and it is you know is older he he's just kind of living the life of pulling cabs in london and you know just then becoming a, a nice happy retired horse in the country and that final part of the story is like the most um most relieving kind of part of the story. I remember when I was reading it and then also when I was watching the movie, it just, I think just before he retires, he's like at, at probably the lowest point of his life and it's heartbreaking. And, you know, as a child, if you're reading it, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Why do people treat horses this way? They need to be free and they need to be happy and let them gallop wherever they want. At least that's what I've, you know, generally gathered from all the people that I've, that have read this book that I know. So, I mean, just this overall overwhelming kind of emotional attachment that the readers get with this and the, and the moviegoers get with this is just, it's just a, a great showing of sympathy that, um, is kind of built within you as you're reading the story. And I think that if you wanted to really encourage emotional intelligence in a child, this might be the book that you would really want them to read just because, well, you know how a person is, you know, you can at least guess what the character of an individual is based on how they treat animals, or at least that's, you know, my own experience. And like, as you can see, like, for the, for the majority of the book, Beauty is like just falling further and further into despair. And, you know, he's tired, he's worn out. And then at the very end, he finally <laughs> sees someone that recognizes him, um, that he used to, um, they used to know in like the original farm that he came from, like this, um, one of the farms workers actually like sees him and he rem remembers that, oh, this horse belonged to so-and-so and it would be great. You know, he's an old horse now. Maybe he can just relax now because basically during this entire time when he's in this area that he meets this guy, um, well, all the other horses are, you know, dying left and right because of the abuse that they're going through, just pulling these calves. And it's just, thank God that Beauty has this chance to get out of this and to return to his happy life. And it, I think that there's one side of it where, 
you're focusing on the moral part of the story where you're trying to be, you know, you're trying to develop this, um, sense of kindness and sympathy and understanding, um, with the treatment of horses. But then you also have this other part where, you know, Beauty could have just ended up with another bad owner, but Sula decided, she made this very clear move to have him live happily ever after. And again, it could just be because she's like, oh, it's a children's story. Or, and this was something that she definitely had throughout the the story, like, as long as he's a good horse, everything will be okay. And that was something that Beauty's mother had kind of instilled in him. And I think that based on all of those things, like an important method of the story too, is that be a good person and then things will work out. And I think that that is a huge, huge part in what this story is supposed to be. It's really tugging at your humanity and it makes you want to be a better person so that you get those rewards for being a good person. Now, granted, it might take a while for you to, <laughs> for you to get those rewards because, well, I don't, I can't even recall how many years Beauty was like just living with cruel people and being surrounded by death. I mean, it takes time. Some people are luckier and they, they really see the benefits of them being a good person. And then, well, again, it, sometimes for others, it takes a little while. It really kind of depends on individual situations. But anyway, I just, you know, I really just wanted to have this final spiel about Black Beauty. And I kind of want to rewatch the movie, maybe reread the book. Because I just have very good memories with that book. And it's a very moving story. But, <laughs> anyway, Aizen is nowhere to be... Oh, wait, I see him. He was basically nowhere to be found. He's been roaming around, not really being a good co-host, but that's okay. Sometimes a cat needs his break. And, you know, honestly, he's been a good boy, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> but... I hope that you guys are, you know, staying cool. It's starting to get much, it's getting pretty warm outside and where I'm at, it's warm and then also humid. So you have that, but I mean, this is hopefully going to, you know, our year is hopefully going to turn around and be a pretty awesome end to it. Fingers crossed, right? Now I want to thank you for tuning in to the GSFC Pets podcast. Again, we're brought to you by the GSNC Podcast Network. If you could, pretty please, pretty, pretty, pretty please, um, subscribe to our channel and also leave us some reviews. We love reviews. And, well, just follow our Twitter page, our, our Facebook page, and also our Instagram. Again, we like to post pictures of different animals, different sources for um, information on taking care of pets. And I will go ahead and say I have a beautiful, beautiful um, video of Regina being just the laziest dog lying around in the sun. So anyway, I want to thank you and I want to say that you guys have a wonderful night. You've been listening to the GSMC Pets Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's podcast.